everyone. Welcome to a webinar by Kira Law. Uh, today's topic is healthcare at your doorstep: regulation of remote control, uh, remote healthcare practices. Uh, today we have Shrinidhi Shrinivasan, Tanya Sadana from Kira Law. They are also joined by Manoj Garg and uh, Dr. Jaya. Uh, I request everyone except the speakers to remain on mute throughout the webinar. Uh, and I will ask Shrinidhi to take the so much Darpan. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Srinadi. Thank you so much for joining and welcome to our webinar on healthcare. Our focus today is on the story of telemedicine in India. Telemedicine is the practice of delivering healthcare services remotely. Uh, so doctors consulting with patients remotely or virtually. Uh, this can have great value, uh, which is only magnified at a time like this when people are encouraged to stay at home. Uh, realizing its potential, the government has issued a set of guidelines formally recognizing telemedicine practice. Uh, we hope to be able to unpack these guidelines today. And for that, we are excited to have with us two experts in the field. We have Dr. Guribal Singh Jaya, who's been involved with the healthcare sector for several years. He has co authored a book on fundamentals of telemedicine and telehealth. He's also been involved with the Telemedicine Society of India, the PH India Association and has been instrumental in bringing about these new things. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Manoj Gulk, who is the co-founder of Biopchar, which is a platform that provides a range of healthcare services, including healthcare information in regional languages and which facilitates teleconsults. Uh, before my colleague Tanya and I dig into a conversation with our panel, I will just take a couple of minutes to briefly set the context for the guidelines. Uh, the idea of telemedicine, uh, that one, if you could just show the presentation, please, the slides. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the idea of telemedicine has been around for a while. Uh, since the late 90s and early 2000s, when ISRO kick-started a pilot project to connect large hospitals and metros with smaller clinics and villages and remote areas. Uh, in the past few years, with tech innovations and smartphones, there has been a surge platforms that connect doctors with patients and allow patients to set up virtual consults. Uh, many of you would be familiar with these apps. Many of you may have used them as well. Uh, but the practice on the whole has faced some challenges and so far is yet to generate the kind of confidence and trust needed for wide adoption, uh, both amongst patients and amongst doctors. In fact, two years back, the Bombay High Court held a doctor couple liable for negligence after they consulted with a patient on the phone without a proper diagnosis of the symptoms. That definitely raised some alarm bells. And at the time, the Indian Medical Association had sought clarity on the practice. Other state medical associations also didn't take a clear view on the ethical and practical issues related to teleconsults. There's been some conversation around formal guidelines that would set out what's allowed, what's not, how to go about the process and other details. Um, and now with COVID, the government seems to have fast-tracked this process and brought out a set of guidelines that A, uh, formally recognize this practice and B, practical guidance to doctors. Uh, the health ministry has made a strong push for it. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has talked about people consulting with doctors without having to go to clinics or hospitals. Uh, the Arogya Setu Mitra app offers opportunities for teleconsultation. Uh, coming to the content of the guidelines, uh, so these guidelines are now part of the Medical Council of India's professional conduct and ethics regulation, so there's no ambiguity as to legal standing. On substance, uh, the guidelines offer very practical, pragmatic advice to doctors on how to go about teleconsultations. Uh, that one, if you could just move to the next slide. Uh, so, the overarching sort of guiding principle that's underpinning the guidelines is that a doctor should exercise her professional judgment and use proper discretion so that there's no compromise on quality of care. At any point, if a doctor believes that a physical examination is needed, she must stop the consult and advise the patient to call. The guidelines also set out the tools that can be used for teleconsultations, uh, video, audio, text. Uh, the process that is to be followed for teleconsultations is also set out. It starts off with identification of both the patient and the doctor, uh, patient consent, which is implied if a patient initiates a consult, exchange of information between the patient and the doctor, uh, then diagnosis, and finally giving advice to the patient. 
doctors can also prescribe medicines remotely um if prescribe medicines a prescription is a must uh it and the prescription has to display a doctor's registration number and other details doctors can also use e prescriptions or scan and upload a signed copy of the prescription there are also whole list of medicines which range from very basic medicines that can be prescribed through any mode of teleconsultation to a prohibited list which will include prohibited list will include narcotics and sort of more serious drugs whereas the permitted list includes very mild drugs common otc medicines like paracetamol or supplements uh, there are also some medicines that can only be prescribed through video consultation say topical ointments for skin ailments or eye drops and those that can only be prescribed if it's a follow up consultation for say refill of uh, medicines for diabetic patients our uh, doctors are also required to keep fairly detailed records and maintain a tray of all documentation so call logs patient records images any data that is during the consultation uh, there are different modes again through which teleconsultations can be initiated it could be directly between a patient and a doctor or it could be initiated through a healthcare worker or caregiver uh the guidelines also talk about the role of tech platforms in teleconsultations uh platforms are required to conduct a due diligence and only onboard doctors that are vetted and registered with state medical councils artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used to assist a doctor in patient diagnosis but ai can't directly give out medical advice or issue prescriptions to patients all in all this is a fairly practical guide which seems to have been pushed through in a time of need having said that there may be some open issues or practical considerations to be kept in mind as the guidelines evolve uh, one would be ensuring uh, that one if you could move to the next slide please uh, one would be ensuring the appropriate standard of care is delivered through a virtual medium uh, there could be potentially scenarios where telemedicine is not appropriate and the doctor should identify that and act doctors have to maintain detailed Thoughts. This becomes very important, especially when doctors speak to patients across media. Say, if one conversation happens over WhatsApp, the scan is sent through email. Managing a proper set of records would be important. Uh, patient confidentiality and securing patients' data would also be important, especially because there is potential for patient data to be stored on personal devices like a doctor's phone. Uh, then, sort of zooming out a little uh, on adoption, reaching tier two, tier three cities and rural areas where the need for telemedicine may be far more acute, uh, is also something to keep an eye out for. The last would be sort of if this is a stopgap measure or a more permanent step towards telehealth and the adoption of digital health in India. Uh, with that context, I'll hand over to my colleague Tanya Sadana to kick off the Q and A with our panel. Please do feel free to write in your questions in the chat. We will bring those up to the panel of, as 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 the conversation evolves. Thank you, Shrinidhi, for so beautifully and summarily capturing uh, capturing the entire telemedicine practice guidelines. Uh, now, before I begin the Q and A session, I think it's demand of the session that I introduce our guest speakers in a little more detail, especially given their illustrious careers so far. Um, we have guest speakers um, representing two interests. Jaya, who will speak on behalf of the regulator, as the first part of the planning and of organizing these guidelines. And of course, Dr. Manuj, who is the founder of My Upchar and is one of the people who is bound by these guidelines. Uh, so, to begin, a very short introduction of Dr. Jaya, which is very difficult to do because he has had such a long and illustrious career that to just sum it up in a few words is very difficult. He is an MBBS doctor from Ames, New Delhi. He is an LLB. He is a former IAS officer. He has served for 25 years in WIPO. He has also been instrumental in shaping these guidelines as they are presently. Uh, he is the member of all three industry bodies, that is the Telemedicine Society of India, Digital Health India, and Sathi, which are actively campaigning and lobbying to improve telemedicine in India. So Dr. Jaya, beginning with you and as the regulator, could you just walk us through what were the process of bringing these guidelines about? Uh, who were the stakeholders involved and how does this telemedicine practice in India evolve itself? Because as Srinidhi had pointed out, uh, telemedicine or the talk of and concept of telemedicine 
has been around for a while, so far back as the 1990s. And it's quite a common place to consult your doctor over the phone, over the SMS, or even to give them a call. And the formal recognition of this medicine has only come about in the last year or two. So you walk us through who the stakeholders were and how this process was shared. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I am delighted to be on this panel with uh, Ikigai uh, has arranged, uh, and also to see my young friend Manoj Garg on the panel. In fact, I am here because of Manoj Garg. So thank you, Manoj, for bringing me here. My pleasure. Uh, and also thank you for the very flattering introduction that you have made. Uh, as I keep saying again and again, I am still a learner and I believe in remaining a lifelong learner, self-directed learner, and that is the perspective from which I come. I did train as a doctor. I was doing MD pediatrics and six months into MD pediatrics, uh, surprisingly, when I got into IAS, the AIMS New Delhi itself uh, felt that I should join the IAS as I was the first medical doctor to join the IAS. So they gave me an extraordinary leave without pay for one year so that in case I didn't like the IAS, I could return to my MD seat and continue with it. Uh, so that gives you one context. The other context is that when I was doing MBBS, I also did a BA with economics and mathematics and political science because earlier I had joined IIT Delhi where you would, I would have done had I continued after the fourth day, I left to do pre-medical, but then I wanted to still study economics and mathematics. Uh, and still later, once I became an IS officer, I went to evening law school because I thought an administrator should also have a formal law degree. Uh, interestingly, the law degree had intellectual property subjects. Uh, they were simply called copyright law and patent law, which I covered. Uh, I didn't even know the term intellectual property then, and I didn't even know the term intellectual property till I became a deputy secretary in the Ministry of Industry. Having gone through life, I'm almost 65 years of age. I have been back in the country only for the last two and a half years. And in these two and a half years, it just so happened that I ended up getting drawn back into medicine. I thought I would probably practice as a GP, but then I have somehow ended up in uh, the policy space more uh, and also in a small way uh, with some of my friends from Ames New Delhi in a couple of uh, digital health startups, which are uh, still in the works. Uh, so I'm on both sides of the fence now. I'm as much an informal guide supporter of the three telemedicine, telehealth, digital health societies in the country at the national level, uh, effectively having functioned as the advisor to all three. Uh, and by sheer circumstances, therefore, I am uh, now involved in uh, this event where uh, at the behest of the Telemedicine uh, Society of India and DH India, I ended up creating uh, with the help of some 140 volunteers, including Manoj, in uh, the so-called uh, introductory webinar-based uh, program with three modules uh, which TSI and DH India were jointly running for one month till uh, third of this month. Thereafter, TSI itself is running the course, whereas DH India is working on creating a repository of telemedicine platforms in the country and telemedicine peripherals. Because once you have this new paradigm, um, but it's new in the sense that it's now explicit. But if we go back to the history of telemedicine in India, the first telemedicine uh, setup was inaugurated surprisingly by Bill Clinton when he came to India in March 2000. So it's more than 20 years now. Roughly after 20 years, we have now a formal uh, regulation, although it is called telemedicine practice guidelines, but under the professional ethics uh, or the code of conduct as it is briefly called or in short called of uh, the Medical Council of India, which itself got superseded. So now currently you have what is known as the Board of Governors in supersession of the Medical Council of India. This Board of Governors issued the telemedicine practice guidelines on March 25th this year, 
which were then initially notified on 26th of March on the website of the Medical Council of India, which otherwise is supersided by what is known as the National Medical Commission, in which there are 33 members which were appointed two months ago, which should have become operational by 8th of May, within nine months of the second promulgation of the ordinance leading to the act, the National Medical Commission Act, which was formally promulgated on 8th of August last year. And within nine months, the Board of Governors should have handed over its functions as the interim body to the chairman and the 22 other members of the National Medical Commission. But I think because of the current COVID epidemic, I am not fully aware as to how further prolonged would the delay be in the transition from uh, the Board of Governors in supersession of the Medical Council of India to the National Medical Commission, whose members are already fully appointed and ready to take over any day. Uh, so if I go back to the time of 2002, 2000, where Bill Clinton inaugurated the first telemedicine node in a hospital set up in, at the village where the uh, president of Apollo lived. So it's his native place where Apollo had built a hospital and ISRO was their partner in setting up the telemedicine node. So which meant in those days, it was essentially satellite based. And uh, the then Department of Information Technology was the other key partner. Of course, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare was also involved. And in those early years, the Sanjay Gandhi Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, which at that point in time was headed by one doctor, Professor Mahendra Bhandari, uh, he was the man who held the first meeting for the working group, informal working group that he had created at the Sanjay Gandhi Medical Institute uh, in, the month, in the year 1999. So if we have to look at the formal history of the formation of the Telemedicine Society of India, it dates back to 1999. Although the current website of the Telemedicine Society says its history dates back to 2001, and its effective registration happened only in 2006. Earlier to that, the, of the three societies, the society whose acronym is SATHI, which currently stands for Society for Administration of Telemedicine and Healthcare Informatics, uh, was formally registered sometime in June 2004. And prior to that, there used to be yet another setup called the EAMI, I -A -M -I, Indian Association of Medical Informatics, which came about uh, as a registered society sometime in the uh, 1990s, uh, but it continued to grow and flounder over a period of time despite growth, and finally it has more or less collapsed. So on paper it still exists, but in practice it does not. And some of the key members of that uh, Indian chapter of what is known as the International Medical Informatics Association, namely the Indian Association of Medical Informatics, uh, has given birth to a new entity called the D Digital Health India Association, which is a Section 8 company registered only in August last year. And despite the fact that in one sense it is the oldest and the youngest, uh, which makes it very interesting. It is uh, relatively, I would call it, the most professional of the three societies as on date, uh, but all three have the potential to become significant players, and I think all of them are now shaping up to become significant players. Uh, in their own way, each one of them has done a great job, and it is a matter of time that the three will also be working together closely because there is a lot of cross-membership amongst them, uh, particularly amongst the top few in the three organizations. So with that hope, I am involved with all three and trying to assist all three, given my vast experience, uh, not necessarily in telemedicine, but in other areas at, in the, at the international level. With that broader context, uh, the growth of telemedicine has been um, at a snail's pace in the last 20 years, but with the 
current COVID-19 epidemic situation, the process of bringing the guidelines, which probably otherwise would have taken a few more months, was hastened. And as a result, now we do have uh, an excellent opportunity to have a set of guidelines, which despite some, I would call them minor issues, on the whole, they are perhaps one of the best uh, telemedicine practice guidelines anywhere in why are they considered the best? If, for example, you look at the United States of America, there every state has its own licensing requirements of medical doctors. In India, even though we have a statewide state medical council, but for all practical purposes, you are merely listed there. You are theoretically always permitted to practice anywhere in the country. Now, with the telemedicine practice guidelines, in the context of telemedicine, we are allowed to explicitly practice anywhere in the country, unlike the United States. You can work only within a state, and if two neighboring states have some arrangement, then you can practice across state borders. So cross-border practice is a big issue in uh, United States of America amongst the 50 states. It's a non-issue in India. If you look at the 20 year history within the borders of India, telemedicine was always legal, but periodically doubts arose simply because courts took certain decisions and though they were not necessarily against telemedicine, but because there was a component of tele, uh, the doctors and the patients uh, were more confused than the judges. So even in the last case that we have been talking of, that is the Maharashtra case, which arose in Ratnagiri, which is also cited in the introduction to the telemedicine practice guidelines, although not discussed. Uh, what uh, was brought out beautifully by Srinidhi was that there was an issue of a telephonic consult, but the primary issue was that the patient was treated without a diagnosis. And why was the patient treated without a diagnosis? Because no doctor visited the patient during the crucial period when the patient, after her cesarean section returned to hospital within 24 hours of discharge uh, with pain in her legs, difficulty in breathing, that two sentences were sufficient for any doctor with any little modicum of knowledge of medicine that this was very clearly a case of uh, thrombosis in the deep veins of the legs causing pulmonary thrombosis. And had they even done the diagnosis, they, the least they would have then done is transferred the patient to a better facility. Whether the patient would have arrived or not is a different matter. If the patient came in the evening and the relatives wanted to take the patient to another facility, these doctors neither brought a doctor in, the husband-wife couple who had to go abroad for whatever reason. So they were sort of trying to help the patient with just a couple of nurses. And if you have not seen the patient, if no local doctor has seen the patient, then without seeing the patient, if you are merely giving some symptomatic treatment, effectively you are not treating the patient. And despite the patient's relatives saying that let us be allowed to go elsewhere, you are not letting them go. And by 4 a.m. in the morning when the patient is getting blue, you then rush the patient in a doctor who finally comes. And by 7 a.m. the patient is dead in the new hospital. So that in substance is the situation. And unfortunately, the local branch of IMA in Ratnagiri actually went on a 48 hour strike in favor of a doctor who was grossly negligent, criminally negligent in what they were doing. It has nothing to do with telemedicine. That they were making only a phone call and treating. Yes, but the phone call was not at issue in this case. And yet this is the case on the basis of which the government felt if this is the degree of confusion, then let us look at what is the practice around the globe. Let us issue guidelines which are simple. And by simple, I mean, uh, one, even though it's a regulation, and regulation as it is compared to an act or rules is far more flexible because the ease with which it can be changed is greater. Theoretically, you don't even have to do a formal consultation to make a regulation. If you can only get some representation or otherwise you are convinced that it needs to be changed or the clarifications need to be issued or some FQ and A's alone would suffice, then you do all that. And given the fact that the Board of Governors felt that this is something new, that this uh, 
the health and wellness centers under the Ayushman program will also have 150,000 telemedicine nodes, which basically meant laptops. But by now, the world has changed to a degree that we are essentially saying, hey, guys, we have been practicing telemedicine, we means the doctors, all through, everyone, ever since we had mobile phones. And all doctors certainly today own smartphones. So much so that, for example, in states like Punjab, the government has issued a mobile phone uh, to every uh, auxiliary nurse midwife, ANN. Even the so-called ASHA workers, which are essentially private people employed for work under um, various programs of the government, particularly in the context of maternal and child health, each of them has even been provided a SIM by the government to have a phone. They bring their own phone. And a significant number of ASHA workers, for example, in Punjab have uh, smart mobile phones. Uh, in reality, the way things are, these guidelines permit you to practice telemedicine even with an ordinary basic phone. So, which means today, as things stand, for all practical purposes, every family uh, in the country, including the poorest of the poor, either own a basic phone or within their immediate circle of 5, 10, 15 people, there is someone who owns a basic phone. And one ever who owns a basic phone has a immediate circle of five, seven people who has a mobile phone, which is a smartphone. So even if you get an e-prescription through a link sent by SMS, you can go to that link, transfer that link by SMS to a smartphone or to a laptop at a pharmacy, for example, of your choice, get it printed with the signatures of the doctor on it, get the prescription, uh, paid, I mean, uh, delivered to you by the pharmacist. So this is the functionality possible, provided you are smart in using an ordinary basic phone, which only has an SMS capability. And this is the context in which the chairman of the board of governors, who happens to be my MBBS batchmate, and then fortunately, we were also MD pediatrics colleagues. Uh, and therefore, I've had the opportunity of uh, having to have uh, meetings with him so often because we, as a batch, meet fairly frequently for lunch as and when possible. Uh, so much of what I'm telling you is entirely off the record, uh, but it is meant to tell you that people at high places have uh, absolutely the interest of the people at the grassroots. So this is a system which has been made keeping essentially uh, the poorest of the poor in mind, uh, the most ordinary people in mind, you are not required to have anything comprehensive or complex to start the practice of telemedicine. And the other beauty of these guidelines is that even though they have come into force on 25th of March, although notified on 12th of May in the Gazette of India, effective from 25th of March, Though from the date of notification, you have full three years in which the uh, practitioners who are currently registered medical practitioners under the Medical Council of India's Act are allowed to practice on the basis of these guidelines without clearing any formal test or examination. Uh, the new uh, regulation prescribes that the Board of Governors or its successor, that is the uh, National Medical Commission, uh, which will again have a board uh, for uh, this purpose, ethics uh, board, that board will then prescribe the examination to be taken by all doctors, whether registered uh, already or to be registered, which means MBBS doctors to be registered after three years. So after 12th of May uh, 2020, they have three years to practice telemedicine without undergoing any formal qualification test, as long as they understand the basics of these guidelines. So what are the basics of these guidelines? If I have to say it in three words, you are finally guided by your professional knowledge competence, which is the final arbiter of what you do, which means anything said in the guidelines is the guideline which can be overridden by your own knowledge and competence. So nothing is binding, even despite it being a regulation, it is a guideline. Absolutely. So, um, thank you. that in mind, then you will find that this is a very, very simple guideline. 
If confusion, don't worry about confusion. It does not need to be clarified as long as you are clear about your job as a medical doctor. If you practice all the things that you were taught or beyond that, what the government has tried to help you with. For example, the government of India has issued a large number of what are known as standard treatment guidelines. The ICMR recently issued a very large number of what they call standard treatment workflows. So if doctors follow those, and if you do proper record keeping, historically the problems doctors have run into is that they were poor record keepers. Any doctor who kept proper records never had a problem in court ever. Hmm. Only because even if they did the right thing, but did not have the right record keeping, uh, then you had a problem. And fortunately, the new system, uh, I mean, the digital system preserves records. So it, in fact, makes keeping records easier, even though with ordinary phones and smartphones, you have to figure out a way to then download data from these phones and then keep it in a secure way so that you retain it at least for the same period in which you would otherwise require to keep your records of patients. Uh, so I'm sorry to interject now. I'm as I said, Dr. Jaya is someone who has an illustrious career and who has a lot to speak about this topic. But I think we, to be fair to our other very illustrious speaker, Dr. Manoj Garg. Uh, Dr. Garg is of course a, a PhD in economics. So let me first clarify that in this webinar full of doctors as it is. But he is also a the founder of a platform, myupchar.com, uh, which prior to the telemedicine practice guidelines coming into force was in effect solving a lot of the problems that are being addressed by these guidelines. Uh, Dr. Garg's platform is aimed directly at the masses. It aims to give in medical information in language that can be consumed by millions at all large and has made uh, access to healthcare easily available to over 200 million Indians. Now, given the fact that Dr. Garb had start and his platform had started functioning some way before these guidelines came into focus, I would specifically like to ask Dr. Garb that what was the thought process in starting my Uchar? Uh, what made you take that risk? What was the problem that you were trying to solve? What is my Uchar story? Tanya, thank you so much for uh, having me here. Dr. Jaya, thank you so much for joining us. Um, very, very happy to be here and talk about my favorite topic, telemedicine. Um, so my upchar, you know, came from <clears throat> a very simple observation, which was that medical information and availability of medical information and availability to good health care. Uh, there is a huge problem in tier two, tier three in India, and the overlapping fault lines are along language lines. It's not along caste, creed, income. Right? So people who typically prefer to consume their uh, media in their mother tongue, they will. They are also much more likely to be in places where there is very limited access to healthcare. That was a insight that Rajat and I, Rajat, my co-founder, uh, we got to through experimentation that we were doing, uh, I think in the middle of 2016. So the insight was, so the basic idea was, even if you look at, so here's, here's another way to look at it. If you suppose look at the US, which has uh, probably the most expansive healthcare system of most countries, whatever its problems, there is healthcare, right? Um, even their websites like WebMD, Mayo Clinic, Healthline, they get 400 million visitors every month, right? That's more than one visitor for one American every month, right? Now it's of course gone crazy with COVID and whatnot. But in India, where there is very limited healthcare, the need for proper medical information in Indian language should be significantly higher. Right, that's where we started with. That's what we started with. And of course, it turns out it's not just a problem of awareness, it's also a huge problem of access. Right? Uh, you know, step outside of cities, barely 50 to 100 kilometers, uh, the kind of medical care available, it would make you shudder. Um, it's it's actually really, really scary. So that's, that's where we started. It was really just as simple as uh, 
uh, you know, the availability of affordable uh, healthcare and medical information, we believe is a universal right. It's something we all should have. And that's what we wanted to bring to 95% of India that doesn't really have it. Right. So the you know the top six to ten cities where we most of us live, we don't even bat an eyelid. There's a doctor, there's a hospital, there's a clinic uh, within probably a kilometer of where you live, or multiple ones. But that's not so in tier two, tier three. So that's what we started with, and we've created a lot of content in Indian languages, all with doctors. Uh, so there's always a doctor involved in the process. There's a doctor in the video, and then <clears throat> when these millions of people start coming out. Platform, the natural question was, hey, I, yes, I like this content, but you know, uh, medical problems are such that it's personal. So even though I can give you a standard set of answers, you still want to speak to the doctor because there might be context to your own situation. So people started asking us to help them connect with the doctors that were creating that content on our platform. And that led one thing led to another and it started becoming digital consultations. And when that started happening, you know, the obvious question was, uh, like you said, I'm a, I'm not a medical doctor, so I need to be very, I'm extra careful about everything medical that happens because that would be the first criticism I would get is non-medical person doing something medical, therefore this error happened, right? So the burden of uh, ensuring everything is absolutely perfectly is extra, uh, heavy on us. So, and Rajat, my co-founder, is an engineer, so he's also not a doctor. Uh, so, we we take uh, quality of medical work happening on our platform extremely, extremely serious. So, we looked into this, and there was absolutely no law or guidelines back in 2017 when we, after an year of operating, we started digital consultation. So, we didn't start it right away, um, and there was absolutely nothing. If you remember, Tanya, when we met about a year back, uh, or maybe 10 months back, we in fact had a conversation about the lack of regulation around telemedicine, right? So we didn't know if we were breaking a law or if we were, uh, we were helping people. I didn't know where it was, but our, where we came from was, um, that people need this and we need to help them. We need to help them in the best way possible. Uh, motivation of starting it all. And, uh, Dr. Jay, thank you so much for uh, talking about that case that Sneerthi had highlighted from a medical perspective. It had absolutely nothing to do with telemedicine. Blaming telemedicine for the negligence of a doctor is like saying it was a Monday when that happened. So therefore, all consultations on Mondays should be cancelled. It's not much more logical than saying that. Uh, so the tool is not to be blamed. The user of the tool is to be blamed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, what is fascinating here is that India's first telemedicine center, as Dr. Jaya had pointed out, inaugurated sometime in early 2000 by the President of the United States. And still, still, despite having this amount of recognition, there is still so much doubt whether this practice is legal or is it not till the telepractice guidelines came in. In fact, you were telling me, Manoj, about the reluctance many doctors showed of signing on to your platform before the telemedicine practice guidelines came. Can you just talk a little bit about that? What were the reservations that doctors felt and are still feeling before they come to this platform? Uh, great point, Sriti. Um, can you hear me still? I just changed my device. I just want to be sure. OK. Uh, OK. So. Uh, because of the lack of regulation, and it wasn't just the lack of regulation, but also the very strong resistance by some medical bodies uh, uh, towards telemedicine. In fact, one of them went as far as so one of the biggest ones said it's whether they're like four to six hundred different medical societies in India. The biggest one, I believe, said that it's unethical to practice telemedicine unless you have been able to do a physical checkup of the patient. Uh, one specific medical society had actually gone so far as uh, so far as to say we'll cancel the license of any doctor that practices telemedicine. Um, and our view, and given this, doctors were very, very, very hesitant. 
to come and do any sort of consultation or give anything, give even advice that may be legally construed or defined as a consultation. So in the initial days, while we could get doctors to partner with us to create content very, very readily, uh, it was extremely hard to get doctors to feel comfortable to do telemedicine. <clears throat> now, a lot of doctors, the, most of the doctors who consult on our platform, they are working remotely. They're not on our roles. Uh, so, but we do have a medical team of our own that oversees all consultations to ensure that the quality is kept in check. And this team also does consultations from time to time because they are the thought leaders. They are the, uh, they define the best processes in teleconsultation, which other doctors then have to follow. So we do constantly in the process of telemedicine internally because see there was nothing available right so that's something we've like built ground up and we've developed and we then ask other doctors to follow the same uh, practices so even the doctors who were in our office and saw that we're doing everything as properly as possible keeping patient interest as the defining uh, light for everything that we do if something is not in patient interest, we will not do it. If something is in patient interest, not no matter what, we will do it. That was our driving principle, right? And that's also what drives telemedicine, which is telemedicine practice guidelines, which is please do what is in patient's interest. And that's why we were very happy to see that, that our stand, uh, even though we were non-medical people, uh, Rajat and I, which was do whatever is in patient interest, uh, was validated by these guidelines. So uh, the hesitation from the doctor side was largely due to the threatening stance of certain medical associations, which now has, the stance hasn't gone away. Those same medical organizations were opposing these guidelines as well. Uh, but doctors now feel very comfortable signing on. And we have a lot of, lot of inbound interest, much, much more so than before from doctors. So now is a, a very good time for uh, using technology to take healthcare to far flung areas of the country. Okay, now uh, let's just jump on to some uh, practical considerations for the telemedicine uh, guidelines, the adaptation for these. Uh, Srinidhi had said, and it is quite evident from the guidelines themselves that they are meant to be practical, they are meant to be pragmatic. Uh, Dr. Jaya has also highlighted that the cornerstones of these guidelines is the professional judgment of the doctor themselves. And you have also said that the measures that you had put into place, even prior to these guidelines coming into force, which were led by nothing else, but just the common sense safeguards that you would put in place when you are taking on such a practice. These medical guidelines have in fact recognized those and have laid them down in a document for everyone to follow and sort of brought a uniformity to that. In fact, these guidelines have gone a step further. They have, in the interest that these are meant for doctors and not for lawyers, have been addressed in very simple terms and there are flow charts present throughout the guidelines so that they are easily adoptable by the doctors themselves. However, even despite this, uh, when we spoke last, you had said that Without having a specific tech tool, there are some pitfalls which doctors need to be aware of before they go into telemedicine practice. Could you just highlight what those are and what are those sort of safety checks which a uh, doctor should keep in mind before starting telemedicine practice? So uh, before you start a telemedicine practice, uh, by the way, just also every doctor, like Dr. Jaya said, has been doing telemedicine since the advent of telephones, not even smartphones. Right? Doctors have been giving advice to their patients, but only patients that they know. Uh, so that telemedicine has been happening, right? But now it's formally okay to do it. So what do you need to do? First of all, please enroll in a training webinar run by TSI and DHI India, so that you become familiar with what these guidelines and now regulations say. Uh, so that you're very, very familiar with what's been allowed, what has not been allowed. As a doctor, you'll be very, very happy to learn how liberal these guidelines are in terms of allowing you to do, to practice medicine. You'll be very, very happy. 
get these get these lectures out of the way then when you take these uh, training sessions uh, and also read the guidelines yourself they are very easy to read they are very well written they are very very lucid then you will realize that you need to keep a record of everything that you do so uh, for what this means is like sindri was saying if you are uh, getting the first query from a patient on an email with a scan a follow up call on a phone with some reports quickly whatsapp to you and maybe some payment done on uh, paytm what this has done is it has completely split your uh, consultation in four or five different places with a very limited ability to keep a codified record of the consultation that happened of the advice that you gave a patient so like dr jaya said no doctor who did the right thing and kept a record of it has ever gotten into trouble right so if you do the right thing and you keep a record of it you will be fine right that's the principle that the guidelines also follows now what is the best way to keep a record of everything that you done is to use a tool specifically designed to enable you to practice telemedicine whatsapp was not designed for you to do telemedicine the telephone was not designed for telemedicine the telephone was designed for convers simple conversation right it's the same way you cannot use a skype call or a webex or a whatsapp call to teach a lecture in a to some college student you need a very specialized tool you need to be able to write you need to be able to draw you need to be able to show a slide you need to be able to show videos similarly telemedicine is a practicing of medicine is very specialized you need a tool which allows you to do this right and which keeps all the record which ensures that if suppose some day somebody comes and says you did the wrong thing which is why the patient suffered you can go back and quickly pull out the conversation that happened the medicine the symptoms that were reported the diagnosis that was done the history that was presented to you and therefore the medical advice that you gave to the patient and you can't do that if your conversation is split in four different media and if you're talking on the phone and there is no record of your conversation or if you're talking on whatsapp there is no record of your conversation or the patient may record a part of the conversation and circulate it on whatsapp and you become uh, the scapegoat for something which is already happening by the way doc patients will record you know or they'll record the full thing but circulate only a part of the conversation and say look at how bad this doctor is right whereas if you're doing it on a third party platform they'll record the full thing and which is available to to you if you want to share right so use a tool of your choice i'm obviously not plugging my avatar use the tool that you feel is uh, good for you that you trust uh, but get on a legitimate platform so read the guidelines yourself get the training use a proper tool discuss with your uh, other um, friends in the medical community the best practices that they are following also keep an eye out for uh, that ever evolving telemedicine scenario now it's going there's going to be a lot of lot of innovation the guidelines themselves will probably evolve quickly as uh, you know there is a reality check that happens the, there'll be certain challenges that will be born out there'll be certain opportunities that will come and these guidelines will be evolve further and tools and technology will evolve as well will evolve as well right so please keep your uh, keep your ear to the ground sure and i think this also addresses some of the concerns that were raised by uh, some of our audience members in particular karen burrito i hope i'm pronouncing your name correctly had asked uh, how viable is it to use casual communications platforms such as facebook google hangout while exchanging information as sensitive as medical records i think that this will to a certain extent answer your questions uh, dr jaya you had also uh, mentioned your concerns about uh, exchange of sensitive personal information over uh for the purposes of telemedicine and how this requirement is going to get even more steeper once the personal data protection bill is enacted so uh, would you just like to shine a thought or light on that do you think that to practice telemedicine in india we may have to compromise uh will 
will we have to compromise uh, uh, personal privacy concerns of users, especially if you want to this tool to reach out to tier two and tier three cities where users may not be that adept to use the encryption tools or to use the more sophisticated tools to forward their medical data. <clears throat> Thank you, Tanya. Uh, let me again try and answer this question very, very simply. The guidelines as they exist at present have allowed the use of Skype, of Google Hangouts, of WhatsApp which, for example, are not permitted uh, uh, or were not permitted earlier in the US. But currently in the US also, they have relaxed. So they had a particular law called HIPAA, which was all about protection of what is known as personally identifiable information. And they have rolled back requirement during the current COVID-19 uh, epidemic in the US. So privacy protections get rolled back the moment you have a public health surveillance need. Uh, and that data then has to be analyzed in real time with great degree of what I call granularity, where you need what we call hyper-local data, because if you have a particular taluka or block in the country and there is a cluster of hotspots there, then from those clusters, how is the uh, spread happening. Can you know that in real time? Yes, today it is possible. So even apps like Arogya Setu, despite being very, very safe, but the government, even under the most stringent of laws in every country, will have access to all your private information in emergencies. So whether under the PDP bill or under the what is known as the GDPR in the European Union or HIPAA or any other legislation in any other country, in an emergency, not only are governments taking whatever is needed, but governments are sharing across borders uh, with countries with which normally they don't want to share anything. So they say, for example, every country is now saying, we want data sovereignty, we want data localization. And therefore, uh, that interrupts the international flow of information and also the international sharing of information, particularly when we are on one side talking of medical tourism. Uh, you have problems if you are not allowed cross-border uh, uh, sharing of uh, such personal sensitive information. You are worried about it being stored in servers in China or US or Europe when the patients are of Indian origin and temporarily abroad. So all those kinds of issues arise. So it's not just medical tourism, even when you are on international travel as an Indian citizen, you are across the national boundaries. And in those jurisdictions, an Indian doctor cannot practice unless he's registered in those jurisdictions. So technically, if he's rendering a service to an Indian when he is abroad, he is doing something which may be against the law. So one of the reasons the current law says we are silent on this, the telemedicine practice regulations, is it simply says we don't pronounce for or against. They don't exclude. I was reading some of the press reports today which were highly incorrect, not just misleading. So two or three reports I read in the last couple of hours all said the MCI has banned uh, surgical uh, procedures through telemedicine. That's a 100% incorrect interpretation. You can't be more wrong than that. Surgery, uh, telesurgery, any surgery, if you have the tools and you can do it safely, you are doing it already, you will continue to do it. These guidelines are not stopping it. What they are telling you is these guidelines don't say anything about it. So when they use the word exclusion, all they mean is we don't deal with it. Everything was always legal. Coming into a force of these guidelines has changed nothing. So similarly, now when you have so much of freedom, now the personal data protection bill in India, which is based on a bit of HIPAA and the GDPR and other local considerations. So it's an amalgamation of three broad categories of laws, what may be called US, European, and then our own Indian requirement. So it's a hybrid animal, which is currently before the joint select committee of the two houses of Indian parliament. They had done public consultations, invited objections or comments or suggestions. Those were given by all concerned by the 5th of February this year. 
and uh, since then i think i don't know how much time they have had to work on it further given the current covid epidemic but probably we are still a year or so or if not more away from a personal data protection act and that act will subsume what was meant to be a digital um, information security uh, act for health what was the acronym disha disha never became an act remained bill and that bill was to be subsumed into the pdp because pdp was supposed to be the general bill when it comes to personal data protection in the country well health or not health so a lot of doctors have therefore given extensive comments on what was there in disha but could be uh, could or should have been incorporated in uh, the pdp but has not happened to the uh, joint select parliamentary committee so even i through dh india and through icmr uh, aims competition genomic center and through uh, another international forum of harvard have submitted a substantial chunk of comments to drill some sense into what is happening there but broadly speaking today as on date those who are privacy advocates will not be happy that there is so much of freedom that we are allowed to use skype google hangouts uh, zoom and what not so even though manuj says do things carefully and that is what we recommend that do things carefully and that is the right way to go but for the present knowing the situation on the ground uh, i mean not only the poor people are not smart enough but the so called smart doctors are not smart enough when it comes to the effective use of these tools so they they behave as if they are uneducated people uh, so the government has said this change process needs not just educating the public but also educating the doctor and that is why they have given a three year breather in which even if you do things which are not strictly as per the guidelines they are willing to turn a blind eye and this is also the three year transition period that the national medical commission has to put this act together to create all the new boards that they have to create so it's a fortunate set of circumstances that this is happening at a time when the covid crisis is not going to be over soon the kind of relaxations that have happened in the us are not needed here because we have been smart enough to not need them at the moment and with that scenario in the us for example the growth of telemedicine also was not much ahead of what was the situation in india in the last 20 years but what has changed between the last four months of 2019 and the first four months of 2020 in the us is that the number of telemedicine consults have gone up 1004 so that is the explosive start of telemedicine which has begun and that is despite the fact that in telemedicine you can use only two of your five senses and the third most important sense of touch you cannot yet use significantly but sometimes the two senses that you are able to use are enhanced by the technology while on one side they are enhanced by the technology at the same time the same technology which enhances it also creates problems of privacy security and knowledge gap so let me give you a simple very simple example from a normal practice a patient goes to a doctor and says doc sir these are the 10 reports that i want you to look at he hands over 10 reports and there's verbally says this also includes my two discharge summaries of my last hospital admissions in the last one year so the doctor quickly eyes through it and is obviously looking first for the discharge summaries because they are the most comprehensive set of information he can find now if he doesn't find them he immediately asks him you i said there are two but i don't see even one so then the patient fumbles and says sorry it's in my other bag or i forgot them at home because i was reading but when you put 10 documents online even in a third party platform unless the system has been designed smartly you may actually send 10 and the 10 may not be received at the other end because of technical issues or you have sent 10 have been received and both sides have confirmed 10 each but you may have uploaded the wrong documents and not necessarily all were the right documents because you had 100 reports you were choosing 10 or you may have uploaded one document three times or one so your numbers are right but you have not worried to check that this is how we are reconciling so this asynchronous process where your communication is not great both the doctor and the patient are awkward when they have to do a tele consult or a tele uh, presentation so unlike for example um, journalists or uh, ndtv or many other tv or bbc or wherever when they come on to a platform a screen 
they are far more relaxed, they are far more at ease than, for example, uh, all of us are. And the poor villager and an ordinary citizen would obviously be far more apprehensive in using a new medium. Changing from one set is challenging for both the patient, the caregiver on one side, and the doctor on the other side. And therefore, this process of change is bound to be slow. There is so much of learning of very simple, ordinary things, which for people like me who have lived abroad are routine, but for my counterparts here, batchmates, this is very challenging. So coming onto a webinar like WebEx or Zoom is very challenging for people, uh, generally speaking, of my age, but is very easy for the younger generation in the cities. And is becoming increasingly easy for people who are otherwise literate, uh, but are smart enough to use a smartphone. And in that situation, for the foreseeable future, that is the view of the government. Keep things simple and easy. Don't be unnecessarily overly worried about privacy and security for the time being. Just, just one. Just, yeah. So the reason the government has allowed any sort of a platform, even a basic phone for telemedicine, is that again patient interest is in their mind. Uh, a patient for a doctor to be able to use a given platform which is designed for telemedicine, a patient also needs to be on that platform and needs to have the consumer side on that platform on their phone. Right. So a lot of patients may not first of all even have smartphones. Second, they may not be on those telemedicine platforms, but if a patient is able to connect with you as a doctor on Skype, Hangout, WhatsApp, phone, whatever it is, the government has made it clear for doctors that as long as they're helping the patient, it is all kosher. That's the idea behind it. I was merely presenting in a stable state in the future, if you are going to do telemedicine as a practice and not just as a one-off, then it is probably best to do it in a structured is where, what I was saying. Absolutely. So, uh, Manoj, we also have a question from Shweta Mani, which I think you would best be handled, uh, you would best be able to reply. Uh, Shweta has asked uh, the liability of the provider versus platform and telemedicine. In India, especially in small towns, there are several practitioners who see patients but might not have a degree or might, might not have medical registration. If such practitioners seek out a telemedicine platform, does the platform need to verify their credentials? And is the platform responsible for the care provided on the platform? Uh, would you just care to answer this? Uh, great question, Shweta. I believe that was the name. Uh, Shweta, so uh, these guidelines are directed towards doctors towards practitioners of medicine and not so much towards platforms so uh, like dr jaya said there is an effort going on right now spearheaded by dhi india to recognize the most compliant uh, telemedicine platforms that ensure uh, all the safety features all the different guidelines that need to be satisfied now let me answer in practice what happens uh, in practice, it is my job to ensure that anybody who is allowed to not forget, even dispense medical advice, even create medical information is a license, a trained and licensed medical practitioner. So if uh, I need to write on modern medicine, then a doc, uh, somebody who claims to be a doctor before they're allowed to contribute on our platform whether in con the form of content or in form of consultation, they have to submit their uh, medical degrees. They have to submit their license uh, for whichever state or national medical council that they're a member of, and they have to submit their PAN card. So we do a three uh, point check, which ensures that they're claiming to be who they are. They have the requisite medical training from a verified medical college and that they currently have a license to practice medicine. So we do that and almost any platform that claims to be a telemedicine platform does that. Um, we do not allow quacks. We do allow Ayurvedic doctors to practice. We do allow homeopathic, homeopathic uh, doctors to practice, but again, they have to go through the same check. 
they need to present all the documents which validate that they are a doctor. In fact, uh, this is a more of a getting advice. Somebody is much more likely to be a doctor on our platform versus you going to a clinic where you actually never ask for a doctor's credentials. A doctor never has their license number on their prescription. They're supposed to. Every prescription that you get on our platform will have the doctor's license number clearly visible on it, the doctor's photograph on it, and the doctor's signature on it. So a doctor clearly states their identity and their uh, registered medical license number when they even dispense the advice. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's important to add a couple of points here. <clears throat> Uh, so please allow me to add on to what he has said. Tanya, is it okay? Sure, sir. So, sure, sir. Please go ahead. So I'm totally in agreement with what Manoj has said, uh, but there are smart ways of getting around the problem of even a quack practicing on this platform. Now, what are the two broad approaches that a quack can take? One, he can team up with a registered medical practitioner. And the definition of a registered medical practitioner then is that the primary responsibility comes on that uh, registered medical practitioner who may be an allopathic doctor or an Ayush doctor. And please note that based on the guidelines issued on 25th of March, I, almost identical guidelines were issued on 4th and 10th or 11th of April by uh, the two boards regulating uh, Ayurvedic Siddha and Yunani and homeopathy separate that came on 10th or 11th. So actually you have three types of registered medical practitioners. Uh, one with the so-called modern or allopathic doctor. The second are the so-called uh, one set of doctors covered under Ayush, the Ayurveda, Yunani and uh, Siddha. And the third and separate category is the homeopathic doctors. All others, including dentists and nurses, and other healthcare workers are not exactly regulated by these, even though there is a clear mention of healthcare workers consulting with uh, the, the doctor. So for example, the government has, through the, what is known as CDAC, created two platforms. One is called eSanjeevani. The other is also called a variant of eSanjeevani, uh, which is currently deployed throughout the country. And in, for example, since I'm more familiar with uh, Delhi, and Punjab. In Punjab, they have in the last three weeks deployed uh, the e Sanjeevni platform for health worker to doctor consult. And the basic idea is that the health worker should be able to dispense what are drugs listed as over the counter drugs and drugs listed in category A. And that is what has guided the. Uh, uh, the uh, board of governors in making those lists. So essentially the first list of over the counter drugs or medicines or whatever is that which anybody can prescribe. In fact, you don't necessarily have to be a doctor. Most people go and get those drugs and unfortunately in India even get prescription drugs without a prescription from pharmacists uh, and sometimes even online, uh, which is completely illegal against the law, but that's rampant practice, unfortunately, which has not yet been effectively checked. So in that scenario, uh, the law is being broken left, right and center by people all through, even in the in-person consult or even without in-person consult, patients or their caregivers have merrily taken medicines, including what are covered in the so-called uh, Schedule H and H1 drugs. Uh, which are drugs meant to be only prescribed under the Drugs and Causes, Cosmetics Act by those who are registered medical practitioners uh, as defined in the Drugs and Cosmetics Act and rules. So in this scenario, despite the fact that initially in list A, the drugs were meant to be only those which are topically applied, applied to the skin. Uh, these could be antifungals, these could be steroids, these could be antibiotics. But if the same drug is needed to be given by mouth, it cannot be done unless the patient is seen by the doctor. And unfortunately, the definition of first consult is that 
Uh, if a person has come for the first time online and has never been seen by the doctor, then if person continues to come repeatedly online, despite the best of platforms, he will be continued to be called the first consult, even though from a layman's point of view, every subsequent consult is a follow-up consult. So if during those six months, a follow-up consult happens, even if that follow-up consult happens with another doctor and not necessarily the doctor who's going to prescribe, then that other doctor will take the responsibility of prescribing who has taken the medicine. And then the follow-up adjustment of dose can be done by the specialist. So let's say a doctor dealing with diabetic patients is in Trivandrum and the patient is in, uh, let's say, Tripura. And a diabetic patient normally visits such a doctor once a year, not twice a year. But in the current guidelines, he must necessarily visit the doctor even if everything is going all right, once six months are over between two visits, physical visits, he is hamstrung. So then someone has to tell the people through Q&As that, hey guys, you can reinterpret these guidelines to say he goes to a local doctor, gets a checkup done to make sure that nothing much has changed requiring a total reappraisal by the specialist. If the local doctor feels no such reappraisal is needed, then he can say, fine, continue with what you were doing. Or if you want to make adjustments, then let me know what has to be taken and I will take the responsibility of doing it. So you, unlike the West, where you have to decide whether the remote doctor becomes re responsible for the patient-doctor relationship, in the Indian guidelines, as in the Indian Army, the treating doctor will always be the doctor responsible. So if the treating doctor is the doctor who has seen the patient in person, that responsibility under the guidelines can never be shifted to a remote doctor, howsoever competent doc that doctor might be, or may actually be happy to take over such a patient. And even though the telemedicine system may actually permit it to be done safely, the guidelines say, don't do it. And having said that, all these guidelines are subject to your overall understanding of your professional competence. So if you think despite the guidelines, you are doing something which is expressly against the guidelines, but in the interest of the patient, and you are you have reason to believe that what you are doing is right, record the reasons, do it, you will never be hanged. So that is the bottom line that you need to understand. So don't dissect the guidelines into too much detail. And having said that, despite the fact they wanted to only give topical medicines, the first amendment to the telemedicine practice guidelines was for oral administration of certain psychiatric drugs. So that's the only amendment made so far within days of the promulgation of the guidelines in the first week of April itself. Beyond that, in, in April itself, a 10-page Q&A document has been produced by the Medical Council of India. So that is an excellent document that you should look up on the website of the Medical Council of India itself that in the training that we have done with TSI and DH India, because I was the convener of the process that resulted in the training program, we were some 140 of us, at, as I mentioned earlier, including Manoj. That training program goes much beyond the telemedicine practice guidelines. It also tells you the basics of what uh, to do and how to do in setting up whatever system, simple or complex, you want to set up. And also, how do you do what is known as triage, for what is more formally known as forward triage, which means when a patient remotely consults, the first major question you have to answer is, uh, is this a routine consult which is safe to do online, or is it an emergency where the patient must be guided and referred to the nearest place where he can get emergency care? So doing the barest minimum that you can do, you refer the patient to the nearest person whether COVID or non-COVID, and that is uh, the uh, term used for that. The French term triage simply means segregation into groups, so emergency consults or non-emergency consults. So keep that uh, basic points in mind. Don't keep dissecting the telemedicine practice guidelines beyond a point. You think that they are misleading, and as they are misleading, because the exclusions are, for example, invariably being interpreted wrongly by 90% of the legal fraternity and therefore it's clear that they need to be corrected and journalists are similarly 99 percent of them misinterpreting and the list a and list b similarly are being misinterpreted left right and center and wherever you have the right interpretation is what the board of governors is saying 
I, in the 30 pages of, 45 pages of FAQs, which have circulated, I mean, linked to the Google document, um, which is a live document, have said that this is how it should be on the first consult. And although this is wrong as per the guidelines, which means we are parallelly getting a survey done, which would be sent out in a day or two to all and sundry that we know, starting with the 2000 people that have already been trained by TSI and DH India. Uh, we would be then circulating it widely because we want to understand from the actual readers what do they think of these guidelines. I, being a lawyer, having worked on this document over many months, uh, my understanding is obviously better than those of others. So those who are reading it for the first time may get confused. If it confuses me in some places, you can imagine the confusion it will cause to others. My own view, personal view, is that what they have said in 30 odd pages uh, could be said in 10 pages. And that would have been better, simpler, easier for everyone to follow, other than wading through 30 pages of text. Sure, sir. Large number of yes, extra questions. Do we go through the questions one by one, or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, I thought I'd just uh, pick up a couple of questions that are uh, put here. I think uh, Amit had a question on, do we need to obtain patient KYC details and proof of KYC? I think the guidelines start off the process with patient identification. So maybe Manoj, if this is something that you are addressing in your platform as well, sort of does it start off with some kind of KYC for the patient? Um, we take a patient's phone number. We used to take their Aadhaar card information earlier on in the very early days. We just found that the more checks that you put on people, the less uh, they were willing to actually uh, share. Because, you know, for think about it from a user's perspective also, they're on a platform which they may or may not have interacted with before, most likely not, and suddenly this platform is asking for your Aadhaar card. Right? Uh, it's a little hard to convince people to part with that information. So uh, that became a bit of a challenge, but over time we find that people are very willing to do it. We get their phone number, we get their address, we get their pin code, we get a fair amount of personal information, we get their full medical history, but not as much of a KYC process. Uh, again, you know, this all of this comes from there not being any sort of uh, legal, any sort of regulation around it. So, Manoj, it's important to add here that this is what most people would do who are not lawyers. But anyone who's a lawyer would say, if you have a choice, don't ask for a PAN card or an Aadhaar card, because the moment you ask them, your responsibilities in keeping it safe and disclosing it to the government under the PDP will be substantial when it happens. So don't do it because you are then creating a problem for yourself. And in any case, when the patient comes to you in a face to face concert, you never ask for his Aadhaar card or his PAN card. So yeah, get, his do, do list, get his get his whatever other driver's license, <laughs> but don't ask for these two. <laughs> but positive patient identification is critically important because the chances of impersonal perturbation and abuse of this system by unscrupulous people who want, for example, a medical certificate. Who or who otherwise want a drug which is which they should not be getting can be telling you things and stories which you may have difficulty identifying whether they are malingering or uh, cooking up a story because of the limitations of the senses that you have and if you are not even doing a video consult you are further at a loss so if they are good actors then you can be fooled very easily so we'll we'll i'll definitely speak with you about this offline so I also had a few questions sort of just sort of zooming out and wondering in terms of what this holds for the future. Uh, if Manoj, you could talk about how AI or ML is currently being used for diagnosis, if that's something that's integrated in your platform as well. The guidelines allow the use of AI at this point, uh, but not to directly give out medical advice. Any thoughts in, and from Dr. Jaya also, how do you see this play out in the future? So uh, the guidelines uh, are extreme. Yeah, sorry, Manuj, please no, say. No, no, uh, please go ahead. No, no, Manuj, you say first. Okay. So uh, currently, we do not use AI or ML at all to dispense any medical advice. Uh, we it's it takes a lot, a lot of development to actually get to a place where you're confident 
that it will be correct. So like absolutely zero medical advice is being dispensed on our platform today using AI and ML. Uh, from the successful models that I have seen of AI being implemented or at least being tested in the field was all on diagnostics, nothing on anything that was therapeutic or prescriptive. Uh, so, you know, scans that can be uh, judged for uh, cancer that can be, uh, you know, around TB, I've seen um, efforts around COVID as well, but nothing prescriptive as of now. I think in the future, uh, never bet against technology. Uh, people will someday uh, figure out how to do it. It's probably fairly distant is my Okay, well, on the first point about use of AI in uh, education is relatively safer because education is very general. It's not meant to be specific to a particular case. So to that extent, AI tools can be used for educating the patient. They can also be used in taking the history of the patient. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the guidelines say is you can use any tool that you want as long as the final responsibility remains on you as the human being. So you cannot shift that responsibility to a tool. So you cannot say I have taken a decision based 100% on what the tool told me. Because the problem with AI is that you can never know finally whether the AI tool is doing exactly what you thought it is doing. So even though it may be better than you, but because you don't know it is better than you, you cannot rely on it. So this is the status, not just in India, uh, I think anywhere in the world, that you cannot abdicate your responsibility of decision making to a tool. However, brilliant that tool might be. So, so I mean, the correct. telemedicine practice guidelines. So quick point. So on our on our platform as well, I uh, we do collect, we do do a patient survey, like a history check, uh, using an automated tool. Uh, but ultimately, the doctor sees it, and then the doctor does his or her own thing completely. So exactly that same process is followed by Dr. Jayas. And further, the AI tools are used even otherwise primarily, as Manut said, for diagnostics. And the biggest area where they used are radiology, pathology, microbiology. These are the three big areas where they are used, or sometimes they are also used when you are doing diagnostics related in ophthalmology to retinopathy, or diagnostics related to all kinds of cancers. The problem with AI is that it is too narrow. If it is trained on tuberculosis, it cannot look at even a related illness like sarcoidosis, because sarcoidosis can be a great mimic of tuberculosis. So it cannot distinguish between the two. Uh, whereas a doctor with his uh, ability to look at things from multiple perspectives, he will do a much better job when he's looking at differential diagnosis. Uh, AI is not family. sophisticated enough as on day to do that. So even I'm for diagnosis. So in my lifetime, yeah. it will become sophisticated enough. I don't see it happening because despite I mean, the greatest AI tools are basically simple things like which are rule based tools like the Go and the chess and whatnot, which are essentially are ultimately simple rules. Whereas AI is all about finding information which is not exactly confined to predictable rules. Agreed. It has Given to be that that on its own. We are, yeah, the, the hope that AI will become what it theoretically can be is not going to be realized in the next 20, 40, 50 years. And it may be long, maybe I The human brain is unparalleled. The human machine is far superior to anything ever built by man or that will ever be built by man. Let's be very clear on that. Sure. I was also wondering, so in both of your experiences on ground, are there any sort of therapeutic areas where which are best suited to telemedicine? Maybe dermatology or, you know, in particular kinds of ailments that you're also seeing a greater surge in where people are reaching out to doctors for advice remotely. See, as far as the telemedicine practice guidelines go, they are neutral on this question. But when it comes to actual usage, yes, there is massive variation in any country. So, for example, much of what you normally see happening is telepsychiatry is big in the West, uh, teledermatology and teleradiology. So, these are the three uh, which I would say broadly lead. 
but there is not a single speciality in which there are not significant use cases, for example, in doing things which you thought would not happen. So let me give you a very interesting case, for example, in uh, doing a medical termination of pregnancy or an abortion, to put it simply. So in, uh, in one of the states in the US, the system they have built is that the person goes for a physical consult to know whether the person is pregnant or not. The testing is done. And then the person comes back after two days to actually be administered the medicine through a teleconsult. So he, the person goes into a room where there is an attendant. Uh, you remotely press the button from 1,000 miles away, the drawer opens, the person takes the pill and eats it in your presence, remote presence. And the system is locked and the person goes back. And thereafter, the person comes two days later again to the same facility to check whether the abortion was complete or not. And in this manner, over a year, few years, tens of thousands of such abortions have been done through telemedicine concerns. So it's not 100% telemedicine, it's a combination of the two. So follow-up consults after all surgeries, for example, or pre-surgery can easily be done through telemeds. But if you want to do percussion and palpation, palpation, haptic tools have not developed in general to this stage. Percussion in general can be easily overcome if you are using ultrasound. Now with the medical termination of pregnancy related restrictions in India, handheld ultrasound devices, which are otherwise exceptionally good, and can be managed by an untrained person as long as you have a good video interface and some basic training has been provided at the other. Now, let me give you a more interesting example that was narrated to me recently by uh, Dr. Mahendra Mandari, uh, who is now 70 plus a urologist and into tele-urology, but he was talking of the so-called quacks that he had gone to a quack in Rajasthan and he realized that this guy has done a surgery for hydrocele for the grandfather, father, and now son. And basically saying, if I could do it for three generations and there were no complications and no problems, that is why they came to me for three successive generations. Had I done things wrong, I could not have existed in the village. I mean, I may have even been killed and certainly thrown out of the village. So I'm clearly doing a lot of things right, which you think only MBBS doctors can do, but I am forget an MBBS doctor, I wasn't even a compounder. This was something that has happened historically. Now, that is one simpler example, but the more complex example is more interesting. In a obstetrics case, a lady has a breech delivery and in the breech delivery, clearly it's a very big challenge where it can very soon turn into an emergency. So such guys have been trained by gynecologists to even rotate the child in such a way before the head is fixed so that the, the breach becomes a normal delivery. So they do it as well as a trained obstetrician does and they are not even uh, MBBS doctors. But they have also been taught how not to mess it up with what are the things to look for and they know how to look for things and therefore know when to refer the patient to the hospital. They are in touch with the doctor on an ordinary phone and the doctor is guiding them from the hospital and then the moment they find things are not okay, they send a message to the doctor or call up the doctor and say, this is a case coming to you in the next 15 minutes or half an hour, which means they have prearranged a vehicle, sent the doctor and the patient is received by a doctor waiting in the hospital. So this perfect synchronization enables even a quack to do things which you have you are not yet imagined, which means the quacks are not a part of the problem, they are a part of the solution. And that is the most interesting thing, that the basic policy mistake the government of India has made, that the best rural practitioner that you have, you have simply ignored it simply because he doesn't have a degree. In business, when you do great things, you don't have to have degrees. Manuj doesn't need to have a medical degree to do what he's doing. So if he can do, uh, I mean, some kind of, you can call it medical practice, after all, he's assisting doctors in doing what they are doing, or he's educating patients without being a doctor by using doctors. How is the quack any different? So uh, think differently, think outside the box, use your limited resources to the best of your ability. If the National Medical Commission Act provides for community health workers to become prescribers, just like the so-called uh, uh, nurse practitioners in the US who can prescribe over-the-counter drugs and listed drugs, 
then why can't we carefully scrutinize these uh, so quacks or jhola chap doctors to see which of those are fit to be made so called community health workers recognized by the uh, net medical commission which is yet to of course prescribe the minimum requirements for them to become so so that is where creativity and innovation is required even in policy making and not just in technology and that innovation is as important as the innovation in technology and this is the message that dr bandari gave even in a video he spoke to me for 45 minutes and i said make three minutes one minute three videos and i have that wonderfully recorded video he's on record and he's saying the government of india should reconsider its policy and he's a very very senior guy senior to k ganpati and k ganpati is the so called father of telemedicine in india he has spent his life in apollo 15 years apollo made a loss on the use of telemedicine systems only in the last 5 years they have break, broken even but ganpati has devoted his life to uh, the creation of the telemedicine system in apollo and in tsi as a member of tsi from the very big and these are stalwarts nearing 70 who are going great so these are the people one should listen to whether in the government or otherwise ganpati introduced new stereotactic surgery to become from a neurophysician a neurosurgeon at a time when for the next 10 years no one did that in the country so we have such wonderful role models in telemedicine so neurosurgeons are telemedicine experts and have been practicing telemedicine for 20 years and here is a government which is itself doing all kinds of things on our private hospitals who are medical tourism cases are doing a huge amount of surgery related teleconsults and this will continue india itself has the government driven programs in the so called sarc countries in all the african countries in the so called bimstec countries in all 53 african countries india has supported their governments to create telemedicine links over the last 12 15 years or so cross border practice is also happening but in poorer parts of the world even from us there are any number of indian origin doctors who are offering their platforms in india the telemedicine practice guidelines are silent about it but the reality is that if it is possible and there's none of them has faced any problem in the us or in india then we cannot wait for international treaties and harmonization of practices because that is something which will take Uh, 50 years or 100 years, uh, and technology and life moves much faster. Law lags behind reality. Very rarely, law is ahead of the reality. And this is the nature of things. If you are going to be bound by the law, you will never succeed in life. You have to push the boundaries, but do it sensibly, ethically, and record everything. And if you are recording everything, the chances are 99.9 percent of the time you will never come to grips. and that has been the experience of my life when it comes to law in india from the age of 23 to the age of 65 sure sir thank you so much for that <clears throat> and although i must say that i quite strongly disagree with you uh, about uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, legitimization of quacks uh, being a lawyer i have also dealt with certain cases where these quacks have gone drastically wrong but maybe we'll continue that conversation offline <clears throat> as of now i think we are way over time so but before we depart i would like to know your wish list both dr jaya and manoj for how these uh, guidelines should evolve and i understand that these are uh, this is a living document as you manoj had quite correctly put it that this is something to grow with the practice as we learn with our mistakes so in the next iteration of this document what are your top 3 wish lists uh, very quickly going back to shweta's question from earlier uh, i think the ultimately it will come down to platforms so the role of a platform the responsibilities of platforms need to be clearly defined um i would say there needs to be specifics around um different practices that can be done so whether you can do off the whether you can do surgery or not all those things should be clarified i know it, the uh, guidelines are a little vague now but thinking from a practitioner's perspective that creates more confusion than clears up 
so it needs to get a little more detail i understand that these guidelines were written very rapidly but that needs to be done and then uh, my wish last thing is i really really wish that practitioners and patients are deeply consulted as these guidelines are updated that those who are writing the regulation are aware of the challenges and opportunities that are available thanks manoj on uh, now dr jaya on to you although you have gone into a great detail detail deal of details on what is what can be improved and i especially loved what you said about innovation and how that is needed to get these guidelines to the next step but if you could just give us a ballpark of how you think that can be achieved so the three points that i would mention would be perhaps in the reverse order of what um, uh, manoj has said for me the single most important thing is the feedback that we need from the users uh, the user is the right person to suggest the changes not a person like me who who is at both ends i am at the user end but i am also at the policy end so the policy end guy should not think like a user even if he is a user Uh, because 99.99999 percent of users are not policy makers, so I want the views of those who are not lawyers. Because these guidelines are not meant to be read by lawyers; they are meant to be read both by ordinary patients and ordinary doctors who don't have an inkling of law. A good legislative framework of any kind uh, it should have clearer definitions. So, if there are 20 key terms, you cannot have three definitions and not no definitions for the remaining 17. So. all that this document should contain is a set of definitions and a set of principles and if those two things are clear then you don't need to write 40 pages or 50 pages of course out of the 50 pages i think 10 or 15 are blank or intentionally left blank so it's called a document of 52 pages it's actually something like 30 pages three pages are only references and there are three flow diagrams so the, and there's one e prescription format there is no format for e consent the biggest problem i have with this document is that it has messed up the concept of e consent by not realizing that you cannot equate a person physical person going to a doctor with a e visit of a person to the doctor so if the patient calls the doctor that is deemed to be implied consent even though the guidelines in a different para say that the standard of care is the same as in a physical consult subject to the limitations imposed by the process of an e consult so the moment you say there is a limitation then that limitations need to be explained to the patient even if he is coming willingly to you and the moment you start doing that you are informing him of the limitations you are taking an informed consent so the process that you are following is an explicit informed consent so understanding the elements of an informed consent is something that is critically important even though the guidelines dispense with it because the moment you understand the process then you yourself would realize when when to abort or not even start a teleconsult and similarly the patient would ally do at the other end when to start and when not to do it and e consent ideally should not be form based because it should be a process so it's a process of educating the patient about uh, not just the consent that you take in the physical environment about the illness itself here the focus is the limitations imposed by the technology if you are talking about the limitations of the technology then you are talking about even the liability issue you are talking about the use of two senses you are talking about the possibility of loss of information theft of information impersonation positive patient identification being a challenge positive doctor identification itself being a challenge but you can still start with a simple format and that is something that this uh, guideline should have Uh, on the whole if you have to have an excellent guidelines it can be 10 times more detailed but those 10 times more details should come in 10 pages not 30 pages so the current 40 pages should become four pages and six more pages should come to clarify the basics of e consent of issues in e uh, uh, prescription issues in the practical challenges that you face if you don't do that here then you already have a 10 page uh, faq from uh, uh, board of governors itself you have a 40 page uh, faq from uh, telemedicine society of india so these 50 pages are longer than the original 
And that means the moment you have to give 50 pages of clarifications in Q and A's, there's something seriously wrong in the way the original document is written. And the only reason the original document is long is it's always easier to write long documents. If you have to say the same thing in uh, a shorter document, you need to work much, much harder. And they ran out of time to do that simply because the COVID pandemic the lockdown came in. That is my surmise that therefore they were left with no option but to push out their long document, which they themselves would have made a shorter document. So the next iteration, I am sure, will be shorter. And the more feedback you give, and I'm therefore, I've finalized a, flat, uh, a questionnaire in a, uh, which is being, which will be sent out as a Google Doc. Uh, anyone who wants to look at the questionnaire before it is sent out, I'm willing to share that document. And thereafter, it has to be circulated widely to all stakeholders, because that is the best way to address the issue raised by Manoj. They have to give the feedback. And I am only raising pointers. Is this the right place to do it? Do I need a 50 page document? If these are the basic guidelines, should it be a part of only the ethics? Even though much of what you do here is related to ethics, but there is also enough related to technology. So should it be an amendment of the National Medical Commission Act? Should it be a standalone act? And the reason for the uh, Board of Governors not doing an act is, if you are so unclear about so many things in a country so diverse as ours, if you straight jacket it into a law too early, you are creating more problems than you are solving. And regulation is the best way to go. And I fully agree with the Board of Governors that regulation is the best way to go because amending a regulation is the fastest, simplest, easiest. If they could do it within days of adding to the list A oral drugs for psychiatric purposes, then there is the possibility of adding any number of standard things that have been used in telemedicine, for example, for uh, anti-cancer drugs for patients with dialysis uh, who are on dialysis, hemopoietin can be added. Uh, if you are in hypertension, in some cases, need to start with three drugs, then you can straight away start with three drugs as per standard treatment guidelines and not wait for a physical consult. As long as you are certain that the person who's taking blood pressure is doing it the right way, taking three readings each time, discarding the first, then taking the average of the next two, is sitting in a particular position, is doing it the same way, more or less at the same time every day, is taking his medications as it is, uh, and is doing it at home or with a supervised person uh, in a primary health sub-center or a sub-center. So a lot of things have to fall in place. The good thing is the e-prescription hair format is slightly more elaborate than the in-person uh, prescription format. And the reason for that is, that the opportunity for giving detailed instructions is more needed in the online environment because you are not in a position to do it face to face as you would if the person came in person. So you might as well write more. So if you have to write, then you might as well write everything, which you never say when you do things online. So you simply write something, take this medicine A slash D. You cannot write A slash D in, in a prescription online. You have to necessarily say alternate day. And if you, it's meant to be taken by mouth or if it is a suppository, then you are supposed to write by mouth or take it as a suppository. So those are the kind of little, little details which must be made clear to an ordinary patient because ordinary people firstly can't read English and all our prescriptions are in English. In UP, they must be in Hindi. That is what Manoj is doing. His, his education is in Hindi. In Punjab, it should be in Punjabi and Hindi. Of course, the English option would also be there, even in tier two and tier three cities, and perhaps even in villages. But going local is critically important because the vast majority of people can only understand the local language. And in English itself, there's a huge challenge. An ordinary doctor cannot speak in ordinary English to explain complex medical things to ordinary educated people. So the challenge multiplies much, much more. And even in a physical consult, an ordinary person cannot tell you much about his illness. When you ask him about pain and about the quality of pain and radiation and mitigating factors and aggravating factors, uh, the patient is lost. And the average consult time in India is about a few minutes, three, four minutes, in which you can do nothing in a physical consult. So it's a myth to say that the standard of care in a physical consult and an online consult has to be the same. The actual practice, there is no standard of care at all. Plus the standard of care, you cannot define separately for only allopathic medicine. You also have Ayush doctors uh, in practice. How do you compare their standard of care with ours? 
So this is a huge challenge which could not have been addressed by the Board of Governors because they were dealing only with uh, allopathic doctors. So these are issues which were raised in the background note that I prepared for TSI, which was submitted to the Board of Governors uh, on the 11th of February, but they were compressed for time. We did not have the time to look at these issues in detail. And uh, even now, I think the Board of Governors is a body in transition. Uh, it will now be the National Medical Commission that will do. And the good thing is that these have come out. The good thing is that the smaller Board of Governors made it happen fast. A larger body of 33 will probably take it longer. So, so I think some of these kind of considerations might have gone into their minds in doing what they did. And the COVID lockdown was the final act uh, in the nail in the coffin, uh, which proved to be a blessing in disguise. Absolutely. It's a major shift in the mindset of doctors and COVID, patients. If COVID had not happened, I doubt that these guidelines would have happened so quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think so thank COVID been... for this opportunity to solve the problem of both doctors and patients. There is an adage in the law community, legislate past, amend slowly. So here the problem was that the legislation was also not coming about fast enough. Of course, this is not a legislation, strictly speaking, a regulation. But either way, and as time passes, we have, the, uh, we have the option to make it even more better and refine this and provide a, prob a good solution to the legal or to the medical fraternity. Um, with all its limitations, it is the best telemedicine regulation in the world. So that is the beauty. Yes, sir. Uh, for our audience, please note that in the chat box, we have given a link to a book which has been co-authored by Dr. Ch Jaya, uh, Fundamentals of Telemedicine and Telehealth. Uh, this book usually retails for $100, but is available for free for a limited window. So please feel free to download the book from the link shared in the chat. Um, I would like to thank both our speakers, Dr. Jaya and Dr. Manoj Garg, for taking time out and making this a truly interactive session. And uh, the insights that you have provided are invaluable. Thank you so much, both of you, for making time and for doing this. A lot to unpack within the hour, hour and a half, and I don't think that we have given enough justice or enough time to both what you have to say, but uh, thank you at least for this effort. Thank you so much. I'm sharing my email and phone numbers. If anyone wants any clarification, including the questions that we have not answered, I'll be more than happy to give it. And of course, there is uh, zero payment involved. It's my pleasure to do it. I'm at a stage in life where doing good is the only thing I need to do. You so much sir. i have shared my email address as well and if you want to email me questions i'll be happy to answer this is a great guy and you can rely on his guidance thank you sir very kind of you to say that and so are these two young lawyers i love it when they say they disagree with me because that's how it should be <laughs> thank you sir okay Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please note our next webinar will be on the 20th of May. Uh, the topic covered will be digital platforms, data and competition law in the EU, the developments and complications for Indian policy. Look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.